Good day, my lovely listeners. You are listening to the Forty Orty Podcast. Tune in every week to explore inspiring stories and insightful information that dive headfirst into the world of autism and mental health. With all those tantalizing tongue twisters out of the way, let's get into the show. Good day and welcome back to the 40 OT podcast with your host, Mr. Thomas Henley. How are you doing today? We have an absolute banger of an episode for you. We are going to be focusing on a more person-centered podcast in, in contrary to the usual podcast where we talk about a specific topic with our guests. We're going to talk about someone and their life. And that person is Scott Clum. Hi there. Thanks for having me. Thank you for com- thank you for agreeing to come on. I really appreciate you taking time out of your your day to um to come chat to me. <laughs> Definitely. I appreciate you having me on. So Scott, how have you been doing lately? Lately, it's been a kind of roller coaster of emotions and stuff. The other week I've been dealing with depression and mood swings, and then this week I've been offered the potential best film job of my career. Lots of ups and downs, then. Lots of ups and downs, but like a big part of my life is my sobriety. I am 12 years sober now, and if there's one thing I've learned, it's to just take things one day at a time, sometimes even one hour or one minute at a time. And sure. um, so I had to do that with my depression. And then today has just been, or this week's been much smoother. So living living with a long term mental health condition, it's 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 a bit of a weird one because it never it never quite gets like better in the, in in a sense. Like it doesn't. Mm-hmm reduce it's just the ways that you sort of deal with it and work around it and manage it just change over time right yeah i've dealt with severe depression for since 2006 um i lost three grandparents and a friend committed suicide within nine months of each other and that just threw me for a loop and it's just like I was at rock bottom for like a lot of people think of rock bottom as an event or like a short time in their life. My rock bottom was nearly a decade and I'm just happy to be where I'm at today and get to the point I'm at because now I'm able to create films about my struggles I've dealt with and Mm -hmm. be really personal about it because a lot of filmmakers, they may tell a story about depression or something, but they may not directly relate to it. I, Mm -hmm. my film autism one man's journey was a memoir and a documentary about my hardship, perseverance and hope. And it just, it connected with so many people because they were able to see how I got through so much. And I mean, I've done therapy for years. I still do therapy. And honestly, I think anyone could benefit from therapy. It's Mm -hmm. been really helpful to me. And well, some of the, some of the strongest people I know, uh, they're they're always the ones that recognize that there's, there's an issue and recognize Mm -hmm. and, have have the courage to kind of go out and seek help from other people. Yeah. Kind of goes against the typical sort of um, idea of strength that we have in our society. It seems to be all geared towards maintaining a center and never being pushed off one way or the other. Exactly. And, you know, it's it's not realistic. And especially if you have mental mental health conditions, it can be very can be very detrimental to yep. the way that you view yourself if you always have that kind of inspiring yeah. frame of mind. Yeah. So I was raised in a family where the guys didn't show any emotion. And so I learned to bottle up my emotions. And part mm-hmm. of therapy for me during my like 
really bad depression was learning to be okay with showing emotion. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it took a long time to get to that point, but now being at a point that I'm okay with crying and okay with sharing what's going on in my life with other close friends and family or an online it's made things, online community. <laughs> yeah. It's made things so much easier to versus internalizing it. I'm mm. just I'm a ticking time bomb if I do that. Yeah. I think it's really interesting you you mentioned that cuz I imagine that there's there's also some sort of input from being from being autistic you know with the with alexithymia i always rattle along about alexithymia but it's it's such a i think it's such a core thing that a lot of people are kind of not paying enough attention to when it comes to mm -hmm. autism and um, yeah. it can have impact impacts on the way that you understand manage or even feel mental health conditions mm -hmm. you know, like it's always kind of on that baseline level all the time that you can't really see and until it gets up to a point and it kind of affects your life in in multiple negative ways <laughs> yeah so i mean my my therapist always reminds my family and stuff that like autistic people oftentimes feel things three to five times more intensely than a neurotypical does and mm. so what may be just like a simple change to their day or something that just kind of eke them wrong, but they can brush it off. Maybe sure. something really intense to me. Mm -hmm. Like the, there are specific things that we, we tend to struggle with mm -hmm. more. Some things that we struggle with, but struggle with less um, as well. But it, it tends to be like all this stuff that's about, you know, life. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, the executive, the executive functioning, the cooking, the cleaning, the um, emotional regulation, things, things of that nature, seems to be um, seems to be a lot more difficult to us. But I guess, I guess what I want to do because I, I'm I'm really enjoying the fact that we've just jumped on and immediately started um, talking about the topic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's very relevant in my life right now. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm happy we could dive in. Well, could you tell us a little bit about the work that you do around your filmmaking? Just kind of give us a, a taster. I've been doing filmmaking since I found my passion in 2004. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing this for 18 years now. I started as a filmmaker in the ski industry Originally, I just wanted to make movies of my friends and I, and then I broke way too many bones. <laughs> and um, I've had some very severe injuries, including like, breaking like, my back and both arms at the same time. Your back and both arms? Yeah. For, is, is this from skiing? Skiing, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. I, <laughs> I was in the hospital for like two or three weeks. I shattered my left wrist and had to have reconstructive surgery, and I was doing physical therapy for about six months and yeah, great times. But, um, that's just crazy. Cause when I, when I think of skiing accidents, I always think the knee or the hip or the foot. Yep. Or... Yeah. I've done those too. <laughs> but, well. uh, yeah. My list of injuries is like, I've broken my back and both arms, broke my right wrist again and had to have surgery on that. I dislocated my kneecap I broke my leg. I tore three or four muscles in my upper leg. I oh broke my, my eye socket. So I have a plate in my eye now instead of a bone. And, um, you know, the, most... the, the more, th the more that you keep talking about this more that I, I, I get where you come from about not doing that stuff anymore. <laughs> yeah. So I ended up, my parents are like, we can't afford the medical bills anymore and you're really going to regret these injuries as you get older. Sure. So instead of being filmed, I ended up becoming the one behind the camera and I started filming my friends at the time. And they, I mean, they are some of the top pro skiers in the world right now. They compete in the Olympics, the X games. Wow. Um, they're in big ski movies and 
I developed a name for myself in the ski industry. And um, I kind of got tired of the ski industry and because there's not much of a career in that. It's just more sure. fun. But um, I ended up finding myself doing documentary work. And that's when I made my first film, Autism One Man's Journey. And that connected with a lot of people. It made it into like 10 film festivals or something, as well as one wow. winning a few awards. And then... Congrats. Thank you. And then I did the Disability Film Challenge in 2020, and the theme was documentary, and I won Best Editor out of like 87 films. Nice. And then... You need to to come edit my videos. Yeah. (laughs) Can you do it for free, please, Scott? (laughs) I can't do it for free, but I can definitely be for hire and help out. (laughs) I did a few films for Disability Film Challenge, and then I made a newer documentary this past year and it was called thriving on the spectrum and it was about what it was like to be autistic and the autism community in colorado during the pandemic and Mm -hmm. how um, there were so many struggles with like i lost all my supports almost in the beginning and just lost so much structure and I had to find new supports and it ended up working out in the end, but just there were so many changes that just made everything so rough. And that film has won, I think three or four awards and been in 20 film festivals now. I mean, here's some of my awards right here. Wow. Is that an Oscar at the top? It looks like an Oscar, (laughs) but so that was for this other film festival in LA. And it's actually the same company that makes the Oscar trophy. Oh, But um, it's 24 karat gold. So that's pretty cool. Oh my God. As you can see, like I'm in my office right now. I obviously like film. I've got the film poster behind me. I even have it tattooed on my arm, like a film reel there. Nice, nice. And um, I'm wanting, I'm wanting to get my get into um, tattoos more. The issue, I love the issue them. that I find with with tattoos is when I was younger, I was really, really, really super against a lot of things. Like mm-hmm. I wouldn't talk to people who smoked. I wouldn't, you know, if someone mentioned that they did any recreational drugs, I would immediately just drop all contact with them and yeah I, one of those things was also uh tattoos and piercings like mm. i was like oh, was, why do you have to put that put it on your body it's going to be there forever it's such a bad idea and uh my, my granddad passed away when i was in when i was in thailand um i was researching mosquitoes in thailand he passed away and i was like you know what i've, I've heard a lot about these these steel needle tattoos that monks mm-hmm. do in thailand oh, so yeah. it's like that could be a really really great i sort of cathartic thing just to get like a tattoo i got one in the got it in the center of my back they did like a whole ceremony yeah i saw a picture of that in one of your <laughs> weightlifting pictures yeah, yeah i i think it's really important with tattoos to choose something that's meaningful to you i know sure. too many people that have just gotten random tattoos and that's not me hmm. but um i have the Three main points of the serenity prayer to represent my sobriety. Nice. I have the film reel that goes up to here to represent my passion for film and creativity. And then the flat irons mountains on the lower part of my arm on the lower part of my arm to represent um, my love for the outdoors. Oh, really yeah, I had one other thing just related to the film. One story that my mom always loves is in at first I went to college for just to do my general studies. And then I went to film school for almost three semesters. I had to drop out because of mental health. My freshman year or first year of film school, the very first big project, we're going through every student's project and I'm watching these things. I'm like, crap, I did this project so wrong because everyone's project was just cookie cutter the same. I'm just like, please like don't show mine and then all of a sudden 
mine's playing and the teacher pauses the project in the middle. I'm like, crap, what, what did I do wrong? <laughs> and the teacher says, class, take note. This project right here is better than any of our graduate students. Nice. And from that day forward, from my first year in film school, I became that guy that everyone wanted on their projects. <laughs> and it's just like, to me, like, that's kind of, when I look back at it, it's just like, that's kind of an autistic trait to me. Like, I think a lot of autistic people within their passions or their special interests are so talented at what they do sure. that for me, that was film. And it's just, yeah, I mean, it was a great feeling to hear that from my teacher because I've never had that kind of just positive, positive, positive affirmation. Yeah. Mm. And and I mean, yeah, I never finished film school. I don't have a degree in it. But honestly, where I'm at today, I've done more in film than any of my friends with graduate degrees. Because when it comes down to it, like people are more interested in the talent and the skill set than they are whether you have a degree or not. You can't teach sure. creativity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, it's an interesting one, that isn't it? Because uh, I guess. For some people, it could be a way a way in to to learn the skills and stuff. But you know, for for example, with myself, I've I've never done any training, or I've never done it. Well, I have. I've looked most most of my editing skills and my presenting skills and things of that nature all come from YouTube. <laughs> yeah, you can learn a lot from you. You can go to college on YouTube. The now. University of YouTube. <laughs> the University of YouTube. It's yeah. it's great. It's free. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess, you know, t today we're here to kind of we're talk about you and your life and the things that you found hard, the ways that you've progressed, the, the things that you've learned. So I guess that the best place to start would be what was your childhood like? Yeah. And what, what was your adult uh, or adult ele adult adolescence? Yeah. Adolescence. <laughs> From your perspective now, more kind of looking looking back after a diagnosis, do you think that you know your experiences are different as well? Like your your perception of them. <laughs> my perception of my experiences have certainly changed since I got my diagnosis. Because now, when I just so everyone knows, I was diagnosed late in life. I wasn't. I was diagnosed when I was twenty three, almost twenty four, wow. and so. When I look back on my life, I can point out things that that was me being autistic. That was autism like that. It's like those things make sense now. Sure. But um, it was tough because I felt a lot of pressure growing up because my everything came easy to my brother. And I felt like I had to be like my brother. He partied all the time. He played varsity sports throughout high school and still gets valedictorian then he goes to college still parties and then also gets into dental school and just everything came easy i really struggled in even elementary and middle school and high school it's just like i would come home with panic attacks every day just like not knowing how to manage my time at the moment i would be assigned a project that was due in six weeks i would finish it that night and just have just this bottled up panic for and chaos for one night. And mm. I mean, I was also bullied basically elementary school through my junior year of high school. Yeah. And I mean, there were instances where I had to present my mom remembers this story specifically. It's just like, in middle school, I had to present a project and I ran out of the classroom when it was my turn and people were trying to catch up to me and I just ran around the school avoiding them. And looking <laughs> back on that, it's like, that's a meltdown. <laughs> mm. There were instances where it's just like, we used to go to Hawaii all the time. And then one year my parents decide we're going to do a cruise this year. Any kid would be excited about that. Me, yeah. I broke down in tears and just got really upset because it like a kind that, of like a a routine thing with Hawaii like you, exactly you it was like, like it was like a radical change mm. in what I was used to and 
I, I used to have something so similar to that. Me and my family used to go to this place called Centre Parks. Um, it's like a UK sort of holiday destination thing. And mm-hmm. this, I don't if you've I don't know if you've heard of a uh, Robin Robin Hood or like things yep. of that nature. Sher- Sherwood Forest. That's the the place that um, Centre Parks is in, and it's it's such a nice place. Like there's. You can bike everywhere. Like there's, there's so many trees around that it just feels all cozy. Mm-hmm. You know, get like little bungalows, and it's not like I'm trying to do an advert to centre parks, but it's it's really cool. And um, in the in the UK, the we used to have red squirrels in the UK um, mm-hmm. until I think one of some some ambassador to, to a different country introduced a grey squirrel into. <laughs> into the population of squirrels and yeah. um, they just absolutely took over and center parks is like one of the only places that has these these red squirrels oh wow yeah but i i, I get what you mean it was it was really important to me to to have that sort of routine because yeah. one of the things you go away on holiday to do is to relax exactly and you can relax much much more when you know exactly what to expect <laughs> right when it's your comfort place it's mm-hmm. like you you have your routine you know what you're getting involved with and like over the years i've gotten more and more flexible just over time but um well i i wanted to sort of jump back on on something that you said because i yeah. i feel like we kind of brushed over it a little bit yep you you were t- telling me about the difficulties that you had in in secondary school mm-hmm. or what what were the days like for you what were the week week to weeks like i mean each week i didn't want to go to school <laughs> mostly not so much the academics but i was like i hated being bullied i mm-hmm. hated being picked on and it's like I was at public school through seventh grade, and then we realized like I was struggling a lot. So I went to a school in Denver that was for learning disabilities sure. prior to being diagnosed long before being diagnosed with, as autistic. I was diagnosed with central auditory processing disorder and just sure. learning disabilities in general. And I mean, I, I believe I still may have central auditory processing disorder, but that could also be the communication barrier with autism. And mm. I think what, what, like one of the, the, the sort of immediate tests that, that people do on kids is when they're sort of asking a question, uh, is this child autistic? Yep. Um, one of the first things that they do is doing an, like a hearing test. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep. That's one of the first tests. And it's just academics was always hard for me, but I felt like I had to get straight A's and nothing less. Cause that's what my brother got. So I pushed myself too hard every single week to the point of what I would consider now being a burnout. Mm. And yeah, when I was in college, my parents were like, what kind of grades do you think we expect you to get? I'm like, straight A's like Ryan. They're like, no, we just want you to do your best. I'm like, that would have been nice to know 10 years ago. (laughs) (laughs) And it's kind of hard, isn't it? With, um, siblings i mean i don't have the experience of having an older sibling i've always been the older one and it's um it is true you kind of uh from from my experience specifically with my brother you know he always sort of looked looked up at me to and c- compared himself to me all the time so I, I i i did i did pretty well in school I, I wasn't a straight a student but i you know it's quite a lot of a's and yeah. I, I did, I did quite well in sports. I did, I, I guess, I guess a lot of similarities between yeah. <laughs> just being and myself some, and your brother. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, there's similarities between you and I too. Like I, I was good at sports as well. I, I played basketball um, in cool. high school. I played varsity golf for four years and I won tournaments and stuff like that. But um, that's cool. And then the other thing with high school for me, because of the bullying, it led to me just reaching my tipping point and mm. really the only way for me to get away from being bullied was to be quote unquote cool like everyone else and start going to parties trying drugs trying alcohol and being that i have an addictive personality that didn't turn out well and that um 
went downhill for quite a while, but I'm sorry to hear that. Eventually I found, I realized I needed to get clean and sober and I went to drug and alcohol rehab and then I've been sober ever since. So congrats. Like yeah. there's no easy feat to, to be, to be addicted to a drug and then to, to come out of the other side sober exactly like, uh, and and stay sober for that long it's it's a massive massive achievement mm-hmm. thank I, you um in the first season of my podcast i did an episode with um an autistic lady called francesca she's mexican and she had um her drug of choice which was um crystal meth okay and um you know it, it she was kind of describing it to me and like she she obviously really struggled in school and sort of making friends and connections and stuff. And she said that the dr- the drug scene, <laughs> do, doing doing these drugs was like one of the only ways that she could always know that she has someone to socialize with. Yeah. Although, obviously, under the influence, it's it's mm-hmm. you know it's it's connection is something that that humans crave. It definitely it's, is. And I mean, that reminds me of like one of the other topics we were going to talk about, which was relationships. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I feel like we all crave just connection with people in some way. And I don't know, like for me, I'm an introvert, but mm-hmm. I can, cons- I consider myself to be an extroverted introvert sometimes where it's just like, if I'm with the right people, if I'm with the right friends, I am very social. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. if I... But I also need time to just like sit back and recuperate or just downtime. I think it's 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 interesting you say that because you know whenever whenever anyone asks me about improving social skills or going out and doing quote extroverted things, it's always either important to have have a place that you know that you're going to like mm-hmm. <laughs> or have uh, people that you're comfortable with and that you know and we, we kind of need that right need that need that focus or we need some kind of control over the situation and being aware of the place that you usually go to it's kind of like a grounding thing and on the other side if you have someone that you're you know really close to it it can be easy to sort of get into the flow of conversation just by like starting off talking to them and maybe drifting around if you feel comfortable right yeah i found when i'm with like my close friends i can interact really well but mm-hmm. then another a couple of weeks ago i went and saw the new doctor strange movie cool. with my friend mariah and then she had like five or six of her friends that they know of me but i've never mm-hmm. met yeah and it's just like that there was almost too much for me because intense. <laughs> when it's a group like that, I'm good with maybe three people. I feel like I can interact on that level and feel like I know when to jump into a conversation. Yeah. Well, yeah. relatively know how to jump in. It's a, it's a struggle to jump into conversations for me sometimes, but when it's a big group, I have no chance of, getting involved in that conversation. So I try at first, but then a person interrupts me and then I try to jump into the next part, but then another person interrupts me. And then Mm. eventually I find myself (laughs) just looking straight at the ground and just like standing there doing nothing. Yeah. No, I, I, I am with that. (laughs) Most of the time, most of the time I am, I'm quite, I'm quite introverted. I like, I like to say that I'm an extroverted autistic person because we tend to be a little bit just, just through our behaviors and the way that we struggle with socializing and the social anxiety, we tend to be a bit more introverted. I like that, but, you know, but for, for an autistic person, if you are sort of going out there and socializing, you, you most of the time, if I was to, to go into a social situation, like if someone just randomly came came and talked to me while while I was out in the street doing shopping or something and strike up a conversation that I am absolutely flabbergasted by that. I just can't do it. Yeah. It's like, it's like my brain's not primed to be in social mode, but no. as soon as I know that I'm going to be in this place with it, the, with these people, it's going to be this kind of thing. Then I can kind of be like, okay, I've done this before. <laughs> I'm comfortable with this. I just kind of need to ease into it slowly. I like the term extroverted autistic 
person. <laughs> and the other one I heard recently was social introvert, and that kind of stuck with me as well. Mm-hmm. Well, the the introvert extrovert thing is is it's based it's basically just based on whether you recharge in the company of others or you recharge in the company of yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that you're not a sociable person. It's just no. you kind of it, it, your your management of the time that you're socializing is a little bit more strict when you're introverted. Yeah, that's very yeah. true. I, I I appreciate that you've you've opened up about your experiences in you know adolescent secondary school. I I I can 100 percent relate to the absolute torment of bullies mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, that sort of daily daily sort of trying to trying to cope in in that environment it's a very stressful thing and I, I took a lot of days off school just because of anxiety and the sensory environment and the people and it's it's something that i i hope that will be normalized as something that's that's kind of like a reasonable adjustment yep. you know sometimes How old were you when you were diagnosed i was around i was 10 years old okay um, at the time so i was diagnosed fairly early well yeah in comparison to, to yourself, but um, it was only until I got into my twenties when I sort of was able to conceptualize autism as you know not just as social differences and sensory difficulties because that was mm-hmm. kind of my th- there was the things that I I really understood about autism in my yeah. in my twenties that was kind of like my <laughs> my in depth diagnosis of myself basically understanding myself and i i guess that that sort of leads us on to our next question could you could you tell us about your journey through the diagnostic pathway and some of the the sort of the the key moments that stood out to you originally uh, this was during the time i lost so many people and then was severely depressed and my psychiatrist at the time was just like there's something more going on here than just the depression. She said to my mom, I think your child has autism, but there's really no reason to get him diagnosed because there's nothing out there that he would benefit from or get from it. And sure. this was back in 2000, I don't know, nine, maybe a while ago. A while ago and it's just like at the time they didn't have the supports in place that were needed and i mean over the over the last decade autism has been become the most sought just one of the most thought of diagnosis these Mm. days and Mm. it's just things have really changed over the last decade but at the time i was struggling so much And I think my words to my mom at the time were, I want to get tested because I want to know what's wrong with me. At that point, I was so far into my rock bottom that I I was so depressed that things to me was what's wrong with me. These days, I don't think anything's wrong with me. Me being autistic, that's who I am. It's okay. I like certain parts of it and it's made me who I am as a person but it's just back then I wanted to know what's wrong with me and originally I got this testing done and the person testing me decided not to give me it would have been Asperger's back then but she decided not to give me the Asperger's label and gave me pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified instead. Because, PDD NOS. <laughs> yeah, PDD NOS. She decided to make her own judgment. She decided to say that I couldn't possibly be autistic or have Asperger's because I make money off of my special interest and passion. Oh my God. And oh my God. so she said, I am now PDD NOS because I make money off of my film work. Oh my God. And <laughs> I just want to warn people getting their diagnosis. I know it's expensive to get tested. I know it's a pain, but be prepared that you may not get the diagnosis you want the first time around. I had to get pay the money all over again to get tested a second time. And oh it's God. just like, all because of this 
ridiculous tester's judgment, mm. which isn't even written in any DSM book or anything, that because you make money off your special interests, you couldn't possibly have Asperger's or be autistic. It's like and, some kind of cruel, cruel sort of gatekeeping. <laughs> yep, pretty much. So then I got tested something like, three years later again. And also because I got the PDD NOS diagnosis, it made it so I couldn't get certain disability help. And yeah. so kind of the, the support around it and the like disability payments and stuff yep. like that is all not applicable to PDD NOS. A lot of the time it's not, and it's not, it really depends on how they see it in the court. So then we went to, this professional in Denver, and she's really good. When she heard that the person made the judgment about me not getting the diagnosis I needed because of me making money off my special interest, she said, that was absolutely ridiculous. And <laughs> it is ridiculous. Like, like... It's just like, how is that even a thing? And that is her just being judgmental. And mm. it's just like, you may, I just want to warn people, you may run into people like that during the testing and just keep your head up and keep fighting for, for what you need. While we're on the sort of topic of diagnosis, I guess, what kind of um, pathway did you take through the, the mental health side of things? Because for, for me, it was, it was initially... You know, I I'd, I'd been picked up by my school because I'd been self harming, yeah. And um, you know, so it, it kind of started with anxiety and then depression, and yeah. then I think a lot a lot of dissociative disorders that um, took a long time for me to to get over. Yeah, and um, so I have a form of body dysmorphia. At the time, I was like, uh, I, I was bulimic when hmm. I was younger. Not like like hardcore, like every time, all the time. It was more of a sporadic thing, but it, it definitely did sort of withstand through the entirety of well, my life up and up until this point, where I decided not to do that anymore. Yeah, and um, now I've got a binging disorder. Mm. <laughs> Sorry, I went off a bit of a bit of no, a tangent. No, you're good. There. No, I'm yeah, happy what, what you your... spoke to that because I can relate. I struggled with anxiety for most of school. Mm. Then came the severe depression when I lost those four people in sure. nine months. And that made it so difficult because I could never go through the grieving process with any of the individuals. As soon as I started one grieving process, I lost another person. And it's just, I could never process it. It's awful. So that led to the severe depression. And in 2006 or seven, I self-harmed for the first time. And that, that was like throwing gasoline into a fire. Mm. I, I have some, like I have scars just up and down my arms, legs, and I haven't self-harmed in four years or so. It's not on my finger right now, but I have a ring that I usually wear that represents me trying to stay stay clean and stay away from self-harm. And it's mm. just like something I look at. It also gives me something to fidget with when I get those thoughts. And it's like, even to this day, when I haven't self-harmed for that long, there's times I s still get thoughts on a mm. daily basis. That That was honestly the hardest addiction for me to break of alcohol, drugs, cigarettes, anything. Self-harm took the longest. I was in and out of psych hospitals for many years. I was clean of self-harm for about a year in between 2009 and 2010, but I was using drugs and alcohol. And then when I got sober, self-harm well, came back this is a really important sort of issue because autism autism and and drug or addictive um addiction seem to be very highly correlated and and the, the same could be said for mental health as well yeah and it is 
you know, like one thing, one thing that a lot of people don't know about the relationship between anxiety and depression is, you know, de- depression usually it com- comes on for one of, you know, four reasons, which is you have like the situational, you have the existential, the cognitive, the, you know, things of that nature. And <coughs> one of the biggest drivers of depression is chronic pain. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, anxieties, you know, could be considered another form of, of chronic pain. Yeah. Um, it's, it's definitely not the most comfortable thing to live with. And um, the, the, you have this this sort of network of different brain inj- areas and um, different different sort of hormonal organs called the, the HPA axis, which is like the hippocampus pituitary adrenal access and they found by doing studies on it that people with long-term anxiety conditions it act, it affects this hpa axis and it makes you more likely to become depressed yeah and um like i can kind of see that that angle in your story but i can also you know obviously with the passing of your loved ones oh yeah you have this situational aspect of it as well is it as it be and i mean loss and grief has been a big part of my life for years now and Mm -hmm. between 2013 i lost i think i lost eight friends in six years and it's just like i lost friends to avalanches i lost friends to kayaking off a waterfall i lost. it's just all these extreme sports have Mm -hmm. a lot of death and mm. it's just like, it's been tough. I mean, two of the deaths, I was going to be though, there those days. I could have died from yeah. the avalanche. I've been blamed for certain things. And it's just like, it's just grief has always been so hard for me. And I mean, mm. even last year, another one I've been dealing with, I have survivor's remorse because there was a shooting at a grocery store less than five minutes from my condo last March. I was at that Starbucks 20 minutes before the shooter showed up. And it's just like, it's just like, who's to say that shooter did not get stuck in traffic, did not like get out at the time he wanted to. And also if I was with my caregiver that day, the time the shooter got there, is the time I go there every mm. each week. And sure. it's just like, so I had people texting me, calling me, making sure I was okay. And it's just like, it's tough. And I mean, I feel like mental health is one of the hardest things to deal with and needs to be talked about more. Mm. Definitely. Um, I'm, I'm, I really, I really feel for you um, with with those experiences. It, yeah, I, I guess it could sort of, you know, create a lot of questions in your brain, like why why is this stuff happening to me? Or mm-hmm. you know, it, it it must feel like sometimes the world is against you. I mean, for me, I know I've come from a religious family, and because of all the stuff I've gone through, I began to lose belief of God and then I mm. began then I was spiritual then like all this other stuff happened lost any sort of spiritual connection those big big life events can have such such sort of powerful impacts both on you emotionally and right you know when something comes along and it's kind of like someone's just like broken the glass on your your world mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah, you, you feel you feel nihilistic and you're like what's what's the point well, why am i doing things what you know is there any reason for me to do all this stuff if i'm just gonna be forgotten in a few years and spirals and yeah it just I, feels like to me if there was a god or a higher power it's like why is all this happening hmm. to me right now and sure. my connection to spirituality comes in and out Right now, I have more spiritualness again. I'm in a better place in my life, but it's just like with all those 
hardships and just pains, those connections ebb and flow a lot. Hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that with me. It's very, it's very open and, you know, raw for, for you to, to, to tell me. I You're appreciate, welcome. I appreciate it a lot. I'm sure, I'm sure everybody else who's listening in appreciates, you know, being so open about these things. I'm sure, I'm sure it's not something that, you know, the, there's a lot of people out there who don't really, it's not really acknowledged that me- mental health in general is kind of, it's become a little bit of a common buzz term. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, you've got to keep on track of your mental well being, And if you get a little bit anxious and a little bit sad, then you have mental health issues yeah. but it's good and it's good that we're having that conversation but i think also it's it's easy for the rest of society to ignore the fact that there's, there's people out there who have clinical depression or treatment resistant depression that they've been they have and to I fight mean, with like every day of their life basically yeah and a big thing for me a big part of that journey with mental health was finding the right medications. Mm. It's like when you're on multiple medications, it's not as simple as just, here you go, you're done. Yeah. And it's just like, it took years to find the right medication regimen for me. Sure. And it's just like, it could take three months to get a medication into my system, then another couple months to find the right dosage. Mm-hmm. then find out that it's interfering with another medication. So now you would have to wean off of it. And yeah. I mean, I had medications that gave me such bad side effects to the point I had tremors from head to toe to, and my jaw would literally chatter and I couldn't stop it. Jesus! And it's like my parents would go to my psychiatrist and was just like, while this may be helping Scott mentally, how is this actually ha- helping? Because I had such bad tremors that I could no longer hold a camera steady. And so now I get depressed because I can't film. Yeah. And it's just like, so it took probably maybe seven or eight years to find the right medication regimen. Mm. And now, now it's like, we finally found the right meds with the least amount of side effects. For a while, I needed more heavy meds to just get me by day to day, but they had Mm. the bigger side effects. And now, now I found ways to take meds. And my biggest criteria is I do not want to take meds with severe weight gain and I do not want to take meds (laughs) with tremors. And it's just like, I've come to accept that I can't just rely on medications to make things better, but I also have to put in effort myself to like, when certain things come up, I have to find ways to cope with it. And it's just, it's been a journey with medications as well. Mm. I, I, I definitely empathize with you on that. I mean, I start, I started meds when I was, I think 14. And one thing also that I love GPs and a lot of people don't know is that uh, meds, meds can have very, very different reactions for autistic people. Mm Mm-hmm. One of the things that, that seems to prop up a lot is a lot of the medications that are for depression, um, although they, they can be prescribed for anxiety as well, they actually, from people I've talked to and, and my own experiences, they can actually make anxiety worse. Mm-hmm. So then you have to balance it out with an anti-anxiety medication. Yeah. And then you've got like two doses of different side effects that you have to try and right. <laughs> try to deal with. And the, the issue that I have at the moment is my sedative medication. Um, it really makes it difficult for me to to get up and be productive in the morning. Yep. Um, as well as the weight gain, the, yeah. the binge, the binging that I get on the night. It's I, I I can be absolutely amazing at handling it throughout the entire day. I can get all my nutrition on point. I've got like protein shakes and like uh, cottage cheese and like um, different sort of health healthy things to eat and then as soon as it gets to a night time I take my tablets I'm like I'm not gonna not gonna do any binging tonight yeah 15 30 minutes later I turn into like the the hulk um, yeah. I just want to cons- I just want to consume everything I'm like the, the hungry caterpillar the worst <laughs> is when you have night meds and you're like 
it's like 10 or 11 at night and it's like, I'm going to have a bag of chips. <laughs> it's just like, that's really going to help me with weighing in on the scale the next morning. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I mean, for me, my sensitivity because of all the traumas and stuff in my life, I deal with insomnia. So like I have to take three pretty heavy night, like sed- sedating night meds to even get me to sleep. Sure. And it's, yeah. So you, you've you've done what many autistic people dream of. You've turned your special interest in filmmaking into a job. Yeah. Could you could you tell us about um, some of the benefits that that this this arrangement has on your life? Like, do you do you find that it's still as interesting and enjoyable, and you can focus just as much as if it wasn't a, a job? Oh, is it I'm different? more interested in it than ever. It's just like, even when I do it as a job, I still find myself finding it as a special interest and finding more things to film when I'm not working. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, it's because of it being a job, it's made me even more talented than ever mm-hmm. at what I do. And probably even more passionate because I just want to learn more about it and I continue to grow as a filmmaker, but it took many years to get to where I'm at. Filmmaking is not an easy industry to make, no. make any sort of money in. Or, as you, you have like all the equipment that you've got to, to buy or hire. Oh yeah. I have so much equipment. I have <laughs> two gimbals. I have three heavy duty tripods. I have a crane system. I have, two really nice cameras, lots of lenses and all. It's just, I have a drone. I have literally mm-hmm. everything I could need. I made made some money in the ski industry when I did work for ESPN or I did work for another big ski movie. And some people might have heard of him, but Warren Miller did a voiceover over some of my shots. And that was just mm-hmm. really cool because he's one of the guys that started ski films and to have him speak over one of my clips was just a real honor and um, how would you advise other people who are wanting to make their special interest into a job how do how do you how do you think that they can go around that when interview skills not too great maybe degrees or you know gccs a levels not too great How, how do you think people can find a path through that I would say don't give up and if you really need to, it's just like find people that are doing stuff within your special interest that you admire. And even in the beginning, offer to volunteer your time to them Mm. in the beginning, build up that network, build up the connections. A big part of filmmaking is building a broad network of people. And so if you can show these people how much you love your work, and even if you're volunteering your time for a few months, six months, even a year, it will not go unnoticed. They will realize how talented you are and just work your hardest. And eventually it will be noticed. And, they, there's a good chance that either the people there would be like, you know, we've really appreciated your time. We'd like to offer you a job or it could go, we just heard of a job opening in similar work. This might be a great fit for you. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing I worked with DVR through disability, which they help you get jobs and stuff. For a long time, I I was very clear that like I don't want to be one of those statistics again that's just sent to a, gr- a disabled person being sent to a grocery store to bag groceries and push sure. shopping carts. Sure. We made very clear to them, I wanted to be a filmmaker, edit things. And at first, the people were just like, oh, yeah, we've, we've seen this. A lot of people want to do something. But then we showed them my work. They're like, wow, he's really talented. We have something here. So advocate for yourself. Push yourself to make clear to these people, like, do not send me to do just bad groceries. I'm I'm much more than that. 
I think for some for some people, you know, working in a grocery store or, or doing something like that's for some people that's that's things that they aspire to do. Mm-hmm. I sp- I suppose what you what you're saying correct, correct me if I'm wrong is that you need to kind of you need to push for the life that you want to have. <laughs> right. You you can't just you can't expect things just to happen to you. Sure. It's just you need to push forward. I've been doing film for 18 years now and things really started to take off in 2020. I've done other work before then with freelance stuff. The sure. thing with freelance film, there are months I'll make thousands of dollars and then I could go three months with no work. So it's mm-hmm. like, it's hit or miss, but I've been very grateful for the work I've done. I mean, last year or the year before I did a project for an NBA player. I made his promo video for the NBA draft and he now plays for the Miami heat. And it's just nice. like these things. It's just, I think the key to it is don't give up on your dream and just continue to push yourself to meet the right connections. And again, don't just sit back and watch and think things are going to happen to you. You need to mm. put in the work as hard as it may be. Seek and, out the doors. Yep. I like that. Well, th- thank you very much for that, Scott. I do have... Uh, what one last question that I wanted to ask before we wrap things up? Sounds good. I guess I, I, sort of a key sort of thing in the autistic community is that there is a there's a very big stereotype in the industry around autism, but particularly like actors and things of that nature, they tend to uh, box people into different roles based on how they look, and you know, we've we've seen a lot of controversies in the media about, you know, that that movie like Sia, Sia. Oh, Sia, yeah, yeah. Yeah, about you know the actors that are supposed to be autistic or not autistic and mm-hmm. things of that nature. So, you know, I I guess the the key question here was would be, what do you want to change about the film industry or? or society with your films, with your autism related films. One thing I've learned over the past probably two or three years is there are a lot of good autistic actors in Hollywood and, Mm -hmm. and beyond. And I, I believe for these roles, we need to have autistic actors playing autistic, these autistic roles and it's just it's kind of tough to see when these people that are neurotypicals play an autistic person and i mean even with the good doctor it's like they are good about bringing disabled people on their show Hmm. however the lead role is a neurotypical playing an autistic person so it's like why (laughs) why it's as if they're trying to compensate for something there isn't in that show, which is they bring in all these other physical disabilities and there was an autistic person playing a patient one time, but it's just like, why couldn't we do that with the lead role? Sure. And I've also heard other things too, because it's like in the last film I did for the disability film challenge, um, the person I work with George Steves, all of his roles are based around playing some sort of autistic person. Sure. And he really hopes that one day he will get to a point that he won't be stereotyped in film as an autistic person, but he can play any character. And there was a, there was a particular person that can sort of springs to mind. It's the, uh, there's a TV show that I watch called Hannibal, which is like a, yep. a series version of the Hannibal Lecter kind of cases and stuff like that. And the the lead role in that, they're, they're autistic. And it was really interesting because the, the, the filmmakers are sort of playing with the 
sort of interaction between psychopathy and, <laughs> and autism, which for me, you know, loving all stuff to, to do with emotions and empathy and socializing, you know, that was amazing. So it's like, let's show the difference between cognitive and adaptive empathy and yeah. in a film and kind of, oh, it's just so great. Cause it, it just, it wasn't like autism was the main thing, but he just slot into that role just so well. It right. was really amazing to see. That's awesome that he played that role so well. And you should definitely check it out. It's uh, Hannibal. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I'll check it out. It's a really good series. Uh, a little bit gory, a little bit gruesome, but... Yeah, that's okay. I, I've seen the original films. Okay. So <laughs> I feel like autistic people, whether they're actors or behind the lens, we need to be given just more opportunities in film. Mm -hmm. There are very few disabled people in the film industry compared to everyone else. And sure. um, as I was telling you earlier, like I can't speak too much about it, but yesterday morning, I just received this email offering me a potential big job. So I'm in the running for a big position and it would be a life changing job for me and i mean it's the it's the break i've been waiting for and just again going back to like what it takes to make your special interest a job like i have just over two weeks to prepare everything for a presentation with this group to begin the process of getting this work and i have meetings sure. with them this coming monday and it will be announced whether I get the job or not on fingers July 3rd. Crossed. And I, I mean, fingers crossed. I mean, as soon as I find out more, like I'll let you know what the job is. But I would uh, love, I would love to hear. Yeah. You'll, hear you'll be amazed what it is. Okay. I'm excited now. You've got me, got me riled up and I want to know, but yep. yeah, it's just like, cool. and that goes just to say, Again, things don't happen overnight, but just keep pushing for what you want and what you're passionate about. And I mean, things happen for a reason. Dreams do come true. Thank, thank you very much for that, Scott. Um, that's that is the end of the the questions that I um, that I had for you. So, Scott, um, when when we last chatted, I asked you to um, think of a, a song. Mm -hmm. that they can go in our song of the day segment for people to listen to that's related to the related to the topic of the podcast or something meaningful to you so what what is your song and why it's funny that this is brought up because it came up with another friend recently my all-time favorite song is the artist is white apple tree, white apple and, tree. and the song is snowflakes Snowflakes. Um, the reason this song sticks out to me so much is because it was the first major ski movie I had footage in, and it was the trailer to their movie. And um, I mean, this came out back in 2008, 2007 or so, and mm -hmm. I've been listening to this song on repeat for... 14 years now so it just never gets old to me it brings happy memories it's pretty nostalgic and it's always a song like whenever i film like snow and stuff i just always think of that song and i love oh, the snow awesome well thank you very much for that scott i will definitely i'll add it to the the growing spotify playlist <laughs> yeah of um different different songs from the podcast but thank you very much for that we're not going to do any q a today because we're a bit strapped for time but um i do want to highlight another profile of the day um this is a lady called carol jean whittington uh, also called the Sh social Orty, and she has an account called mind your artistic brain which is all underscores between the um or between the words Mind your autistic brain, and she does a lot for bringing people from the autistic community together. She produces a lot of content on how to make it, how to produce good content, and uh, she does a lot of good work in the community. And she's definitely worth a follow, especially if you're a creator and um, you're trying to trying to improve your skills. So that is our profile of the day. 
Carol Jean Whittington, the social OT at Mind Your Autistic Brain. So um, this comes to the the very end of the podcast. Uh, I want to say thank you to my YouTube um, followers as well as anyone who's listening to the podcast um, on a regular basis, uh, listen to season one, all that stuff, and also um, my patrons, specifically Mr. Patrick Vetti for always supporting me with my work, everything like that. And of course, thank you very much, Scott, for coming on to chat. Have you enjoyed your time on the podcast? Yeah, it was a great time. Um, you've run one of the best podcasts I've been on, so... Oh, been, I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah, so it's been really to easy to talk to you. I've been, yeah, it's just been nice. It just felt like a conversation this whole time. It didn't feel yeah. like, um, felt less like an interview and more like we were just having a nice conversation. So it made me feel really comfortable and glad we could do this. I'm very glad, Scott. Thank you for your kind words. And thank you to everybody else who's who's tuned in. And just remember that you can find the 40 Audi podcast on YouTube under Asperger's Growth, or you can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, all of the podcasting streaming services, the 40 Audi podcast, you can find that there. Um, I would also point you towards my Instagram. Uh, if you want to, to get in contact, um, you can DM me on there. Uh, you can check out some of the posts that I've been doing. Um, and if you, if you want to get involved and you want to ask um, any of my guests' questions, that is the place to go. That's that's all for me. Thank you very much for listening, and thank you very much, Scott. I'll see you in another episode of the 4040 Podcast. See you later, guys. Bye.